started when Simon gets back. Since I was here, I left in 2007. Um, I worry, actually, I just opened that. Okay, thanks. Um, I've been back a couple times for some brief meetings, but otherwise uh, not for an extended period since. So shall we? Yes. Great. All right, so as he was just talking about, Alex, you may recognize him. Um, did his undergrad here, uh, working with Shalko Ivicic on SDSS and on uh, asteroids in SD SDSS. He then went up to University of Victoria to do his PhD with JJ Cavallars um, on trans-Neptunian binaries. Uh, after a couple of stops for postdocs at CFA in Berkeley, he's now at the Southwest Research Institute working on the New Horizons project, um, as well as the continuing mission that will go on beyond Pluto target um, KBOs that he actually co-discovered uh, for for the continuing mission. So um, let's welcome Alex and, and listen to his exciting talk. Thanks. So um, I wanted to talk to you guys today about, about the New Horizons mission. We're ramping up into, we're in approach phase two now. So um, Pluto is getting ever nearer and ever larger in our instruments. Um, so I thought I would tell you guys a bit about the Pluto mission at first and kind of what to expect. Um, and then I'll move on to talking about uh, what got me into the mission in the first place, which is the post-Pluto mission, and um, trying to understand the Kuiper belt and the context of Pluto. Um, so I'll, I'll do that in a, a couple of ways, uh, try to provide some, some background information on the Kuiper belt and what the Kuiper belt can tell us about planet formation and our, our place in the universe. And, um, other observational uh, and theoretical studies that are currently ongoing to try to understand um, this region of our solar system. So uh, part of what makes this exciting for me is that um, this is the, 2015 is the first year in which we're seeing um, a new planet-like body for the first time since 1989. And we actually get two this year. We get both Ceres and Pluto, which are both dwarf planets. Um, but this is the, the last first time we saw a new world like this, um, the Voyager 2 flyby in 89. And one of the key, um, key differences between what we're doing now and, and what happened with Voyager, you know, it takes a long time to cross the solar system, especially if you're making a lot of stops along the way. Uh, Voyager was launched in 1977, and it was designed before that. So the technology it was carrying um, dates from the 70s. New Horizons was uh, conceived around this time in 1989, but it wasn't given the final uh, sort of design go-ahead until the 2000s. And so it was developed with 21st century technology. And as far as a first flyby goes, it is the most heavily instrumented um, uh, first reconnaissance that we've ever flown to uh, a world like this. So this is where we're going. Um, these are our best current maps of Pluto and Charon. These are uh, a combination of a variety of data sources, including occultation information from the mutual event epoch um, from uh, about 15 years ago when, when Charon and Pluto's orbital plane was aligned such that Charon was sweeping across the disk of Pluto and then going behind Pluto, and we could use that and the photometric information to map the surfaces. Additionally, uh, information from marginally resolved images from HST were used to uh, create these maps. But this is about the um, extent of information we have about the surface features on Pluto and Charon as exist, and these sizes are, size ratios are a little bit off here. But this is what, um, 
this is what interests me. This is Pluto's context. Um, we didn't know about this um, for certain before about 20 years ago. Uh, this is the Kuiper Belt, and more generally, uh, the trans-Neptunian region. So you see there the orbits of all the planets in Cyan, the orbit of Pluto in white, and then um, I'll describe this object on this orange orbit uh, later. This is our Kuiper Belt target. The trajectory of New Horizons here is illustrated in yellow. We're bulleting out of the solar system um, incredibly quickly. This, uh, the mission was designed to take less than a decade to reach its target. Um, at launch, it was the, the fastest mission ever launched. There are other spacecraft that have traveled faster in whatever frame you want to, to decide, but essentially to cross the solar system in that time, they designed the smallest spacecraft they could and put it on the biggest rocket anyone would sell them. Um, this, uh, this booster was launched basically empty and um, it had a special upper stage. Uh, it was the first of the, the five booster models of this rocket. And so it crossed the moon's orbit in nine hours and it reached Jupiter in less than a year. Well, sorry, in almost exactly a year. Uh, so it's moving incredibly quickly, and um, it will not stop at Pluto. It can't stop at Pluto. In order to stop, you'd have to carry along with it a rocket of equivalent size or um, lithobreak, which we'd rather not do. Um, so it will uh, continue on out past the Pluto system. We're doing a single flyby, and sort of the mantra that Jim Green likes to uh, repeat is that um, this has sort of been the archetypal way we explore new worlds like this. First we do a first reconnaissance flyby, then we do an orbiter, and then perhaps we do a lander. Um, whether or not we ever you know, get around to putting a lander on Pluto, I don't know, but this is the way it's sort of progressed with, with other worlds in the solar system. And we're now just doing this first reconnaissance of Pluto. So this is New Horizons. It's about the size of a grand piano. Um, it's sort of dominated by its high gain antenna, uh, which is substantially smaller even than the Voyagers. Um, The whole thing, since we're operating in the outer solar system where sunlight is rather sparse, is powered by um, an RTG, uh, 11 kilograms of plutonium-238. Um, it dumps about 5 kilowatts of heat energy, and of that we can extract about 200 watts currently of usable uh, electrical power. That's what we have to operate the entire spacecraft. It's less than a single element in your toaster oven. Um, and that's what our whole bird operates on. It carries seven uh, science instruments. Um, that uh, span the gamut of imagers, uh, hyperspectral uh, uh, mappers, imaging spectrometers. Uh, we have a UV uh, spectrometer and infrared spectrometers. Uh, we carry a suite of plasma instruments to measure the um, interactions of solar wind and uh, the uh, other plasma environments in the outer solar system. We carry the first um, interplanetary uh, student-designed instrument called the Misha Burney Student Dust Counter, which is essentially a very souped-up microphone that is recording impacts onto the spacecraft of dust. And so they're tracing the dust profile throughout the solar system. And it was designed, built, implemented, delivered, and run by graduate students at CU Boulder. Um, there's also the Rex Radio Science Experiment, um, where they're using essentially uh, very precise timing information from the DSN to do uh, radio uh, measurements through the atmosphere of Pluto and, and um, do Doppler ranging and things like this around the system to measure the, the mass of the component bodies. Um, essentially, all these instruments are running um, at full bore as they fly through the system, and because we're so far away and we have a very small power budget, and we don't have a camera platform, we can't have that antenna pointed back to the Earth and dump the data back to us in real time. So instead, uh, we don't hear anything back from New Horizons for long periods of time. And when we do, the data rate is very low. It's about 1,000 bits per second. So um, it's like the early days of the internet if you had a bad connection at the time is sort of the speed that we get back from the outer solar system here. So what they developed the mission to do instead is um, rather elegantly, they have these giant solid state recorders on board. And so it will take all of this data, um, collate it on board, be actively running uh, you know, bit checks, essentially swapping it back and forth between these two recorders, and then slowly beam the data back to us over about 16 months. So the data return is highly prioritized. We get compressed versions of everything first, and then we get the full resolution versions later. Um, this allows us to do some quick look on the really high, uh, sort of high pressing, high fidelity data that you know we'd really like doing flyby. Some of the high resolution maps we get done right away, and then everything else is tiered, and we'll get back over the following 16 months. Um, like I said, this is the the data link, um, and critically for what I would like to do with New Horizons is the remaining hydrazine fuel. New Horizons doesn't um, use gyros to maneuver or reaction wheels; it uses thrusters, uh, and we don't have a camera platform. So anytime that we want to to take an image or spin down to send uh, data back 
uh, or do a maneuver, we have to burn hydrazine. We have to run these thrusters. So everything is a consumable. Um, given what we expect to do in the Pluto system, we'll probably have roughly 30 kilograms of fuel left after the Pluto flyby that we can use at our discretion essentially to target something more distant. That gave us about 130 meters per second of maneuvering capability um, on something that's going roughly 13 kilometers per second. So it's a very small tweak on that trajectory. It's a very narrow cone piercing the outer solar system. So what we wanted to do starting, the, the, the idea of this started about a decade ago, and in earnest we began the survey about four years ago, looking for a more distant target in this cone that we could reach with the spacecraft. Um, and I'll describe that later. So we launched in 2006. I was an undergrad here at the time, um, and I was not involved in the mission. I just watched it from afar. Uh, they crossed, like I said, the, the orbit of the moon in nine hours, and they crossed the orbit of Jupiter. They actually did a Jupiter gravity assist, gave them about an extra 9,000 miles an hour, which is nice. Thank you. And um, did a, a nice calibration campaign instrument testing period where they, they sort of did a quick flyby survey of the Jupiter system as like a dress <laughs> rehearsal for the Pluto system. We got some really lovely images. These are both images from the, uh, from the spacecraft. And then in 2015, we fly through the Pluto system and leave. So this is our... This is the menagerie that we're rapidly approaching. At launch, we knew of Pluto and its large moon, Charon, and it wasn't until after that that we started recognizing that there were other satellites in the system using deep imagery from HST and um, advanced techniques for suppressing the PSFs of Pluto and Charon sufficiently that you can see these very faint sources around it. The <coughs> faintest ones, like Styx and Kerberos here, are of order 27th magnitude. They're incredibly, incredibly faint, and Pluto and Charon are very bright. We're looking at sort of 12 magnitudes of contrast in some, some bands, yeah. Can you get some idea of the scale on those things? Um, Pluto and Charon are separated by about 20,000 kilometers. But, but what, what is that in, in our sector? So, you know? Oh, um, at this range, it's, uh, I should actually have that off the top of my head, but I think it's, a, it's about an arc second for the Pluto and Charon separation of order. It's not a fraction of that, and it's not multiples of that. Is that this is HST imagery here. Um, we don't have any AO imagery um, yet that I'm aware of that gets us down to Kerberos. There might be some pre-covering images uh, that I haven't seen, but, but certainly all the discovery work for these satellites was done with HST. You just need that throughput to get so faint. Um, so, you know, we launched this system and the whole mission was motivated purely by Pluto and Charon, but suddenly we get something much richer. We're looking at a system where, with complex multi-body interactions, um, the disk uh, of these satellites is very cold, they're very coplanar, uh, so it looks like they probably formed in some kind of a common event. You're basically looking at a circumbinary system here. You know, the very center of Pluto and Charon lies outside both bodies. This is a, a really great analog for a circumbinary planet, um, but not only a circumbinary planet, but a multiply resonant system in which these bodies are, um, it's just been demonstrated that several of the small satellites are in a complex three-body um, resonance, and their spin states are coupled as well. So they're chaotically tumbling, but they're influencing each other's tumbles. And we're learning this from light curves. It's an incredibly dynamically rich system. The origin of the system is still unknown. It's very difficult. I have some friends that are working on trying to come up with a scenario in which you can form the pluto Charon binary, large, uh, likely in a, a uh, scenario very similar to the Earth-Moon formation event, an um, oblique uh, impact between two equivalent sized bodies that generates a large disk of material from which the secondary body reaccretes, and then you're left with this large disk of material that you could uh, potentially form these smaller satellites from. But the details of making that work are still eluding um, a lot of a lot of theorists. So there's a lot of work to be done here, and hopefully during the flyby we can resolve some of the, the questions and maybe come up with some new ones for for my theorist colleagues. Um, and that. Pluto Charon formation event is actually part of the motivation for this mission. You know, we like to do plan uh, comparative planetology where we kind of go and, and, and look at the same sort of events as they occurred in very different environments. And the Pluto Charon binary is a wonderful analog to the Earth Moon system. And so trying to, trying to get a look at how, what the end state of that system is um, provides a really nice pin to, uh, to our understanding of the origin of our own system. Um, I really like showing these quotes. I show them in almost all my talks when I'm talking about the Pluto-Charon system. This is just basically on the value of binary systems all across astrophysics. But in this particular um, example, I think it's particularly cute. When, when Pluto was discovered, um, the, the search for Pluto was being motivated by this idea that there was a, a planet perturbing the orbits of Uranus and Neptune, something unseen beyond, beyond the orbit of Neptune, this planet X. And so uh, when they found it, the, uh, they ascribed the perturbations on Uranus and Neptune to Pluto and said, 
given those, given those uh, perturbations, how massive must Pluto be? And they got this wonderfully tight constraint of 1.08 plus or minus 0.23 Earth masses. So it was a planet out there. And then um, over the intervening decades, the orbits of Uranus and Neptune were measured better and better. And eventually, like, the mass was slowly dropping. But then finally, the real clincher was that uh, Christian Harrington spotted this uh, time variable lump showing up on the limb of Pluto, which turned out to be uh, Charon, this large satellite. And instantly, once you've got that in the separation, you've got the orbital period in the separation, you have a system mass. And that's, you know, uh, substantially slower, uh, smaller, 0 0.0017 Earth masses there. So you, if you want to talk about demoting Pluto uh, from planet status, it wasn't the IAU that did it. It was Christian Harrington. Um, so we're on approach now. These are some of our uh, latest public release images from uh, two of the onboard instrument suites. Uh, the one on the left here is our first color composite taken from the spacecraft using the uh, Ralph imager subcomponent of, or sorry, the MBIC uh, subcomponent of the Ralph instrument, which is our, um, our color imaging subsystem. Uh, this is a color composite I created. We have the challenge that, for scientific reasons, uh, we don't have uh, many bands in the optical. We have a red and a blue channel. And then we have infrared channels, uh, a broad infrared channel and a narrow CH4 ice channel. And so that's, those were the, the channels that you wanted to do some um, sort of characteristic measurements of the surface. But it's difficult to make a nice true color image. And so we've come up with some techniques that fold in the information from the near IR and make some assumptions about the surface properties to propagate a spectrum through those bands. And this is the um, product of the tools I've written for that. So as we get closer, we're going to be vetting these tools more and getting hopefully better and better true color imagery. On the right there is um, an image from January from our long range imager, Lori, uh, my favorite instrument on board. It's a monochromatic imager, but it's, it's a very large telescope for the spacecraft. So we get very sharp imagery from it. It'll be the thing that produces the high resolution maps of Pluto and does the long range imaging in the Kuiper belt that we would like to do. Um, so this is in a uh, inertial frame. The wobble that you're seeing on Pluto there is the wobble about the very center. If you were looking at the system, this is how it would appear. Um, and so this is, this is truly looking at a binary system. And it's very evident just from this data. Um, my colleague at SWERI, uh, another one of the postdocs, produced this lovely visualization of kind of what we can expect. She subbed in the Earth and the Moon for the Pluto system, rescaled appropriately, and took the actual sequence of data that we'll be taking from LORI. So the color isn't, isn't uh, representative, but it's the, the resolution is, uh, with a date down there on the right of what we can expect. So this is now um, about a month out from encounter. And uh, on the right there, you're seeing the resolution on the disk of Pluto that we could expect were it a scaled version of the Earth. And it's going to be a kind of a wild final ride as we approach because the resolution will be increasing so rapidly. So every day we'll be getting something so much better than the day before. And then in that final, final week uh, before the flyby on July 14th, um, we'll be approaching within uh, about 12,000 kilometers of the surface. And we'll be taking um, imagery like this. So if the Earth was rescaled to um, the size of Pluto, and this is the uh, uh, at the flyby distance that we're taking with the, the instruments that we have, we get down to about 70 uh, meters per pixel of resolution. Yeah? Can I just comment the message is really awesome? Yeah. <laughs> I, Amanda, yeah okay. Amanda made both of these. She made a number of others. One of my favorites that I didn't include in this, she's got various like works of art that she's downsampled to the best HST resolution in terms of like number of pixels across the disk and says, you know, guess what this is, and then slowly brings it up to the, the, uh, the uh, uh, New Horizons resolution. And it's like, ta-da, it's Mona Lisa. Um, so this, I mean, you can, you can look at, this is New York City, and you can count the piers along the island. You can count the ponds in Central Park. Um, we don't expect to see piers or ponds on Pluto, <laughs> but uh, we could see them if they were there. Uh, we won't get this resolution for the whole globe because we've got a single narrow angle camera, so we'll get lower resolution across the whole globe on approach, and then we'll get stripes, swaths across the surface at this higher resolution. Um, the resolution of the color imager is somewhat lower um, but we'll be doing some data fusion to try to get some, uh, you know, complementary information out of both. Um, the best, I think the, the way that we've been saying this is that the best color imagery on Pluto will be equivalent to the best black and white imagery on Sharon, which is on roughly the far side of Pluto from us as we fly by. Um, the timing of the approach was designed such, and this is one of my favorite aspects of the sort of uh, mission design work that was done so long ago, and it speaks to how well we understand the pluto Sharon binary. It was designed so that on approach, um, the rear-facing hemisphere of Pluto would be illuminated by Charon shine because we will not see it in direct sunlight. 
So we're flying by during a phase where well, Sharon will be in direct sunlight in full phase, and we can actually try to do imaging of the darkened face using moonlight. Um, this is the last object that we've flown by that we think is any kind of an analog for Pluto. This is the uh, Neptune's largest satellite, Triton. Um, <coughs> Triton is an oddball in the solar system. It's a large satellite, um, but it's in a highly inclined retrograde orbit, uh, which we don't know of any other the major satellites that are like this. Additionally, its composition and density are very unlike any other satellites that formed in a in a planetary um, a trans sorry circumplanetary disk. So what we think Triton represents is a captured Kuiper Belt object. It was likely locked in a Pluto Sharon like binary at some point. Uh, experienced a close flyby of Neptune. The binary was disrupted. That secondary was ejected and carried away the excess angular momentum and left Triton bound. It was then evolved under tides and remained captured for the age of the solar system. Um, but we saw Triton in uh, 1989 close up with Voyager 2. We didn't get full coverage of the globe because of the, the orientation of the flyby. But it's a strange and active world. Um, it's covered in um, terrain that looks kind of like the salt domes that we see across the Middle East. Um, that likely have to do with basically ice convection, dissimilar compositions in ice creating these sort of flows. Um, there are geysers on Triton that we could see across its limb, plumes blowing, blowing up from the, under the surface. Um, but, you know, the bulk properties, the photometric properties of Triton, while, whilst its origin is likely common to Pluto, it's, it's sufficiently distinct that we don't know how much of what we learned from Triton will carry over to Pluto. The um, albedo variations across the surface of Triton are much less pronounced than they are across Pluto. Pluto, for example, has over a factor of 10 in albedo across its surface and these great big dark and bright patches. And we don't know um, if those represent some kind of seasonal volatile transport where you're seeing deposits of, of um, bright ices moving across dark terrain or whether they represent something else. So um, we're really treading into the unknown with Pluto. Um, as we approach, uh, we're hoping to learn things about um, it's incredibly dynamic atmosphere. Uh, its atmosphere was discovered in the 80s through uh, occultation measurements, stellar occultations. So observing a star as it passes behind Pluto, it didn't blink out instantaneously. Instead, it faded as it went behind the atmosphere. Um, so we've been using these stellar occultations to follow um, the state of Pluto's atmosphere for the last two decades, um, almost three decades now. And uh, it changes with time. Pluto's on a highly eccentric orbit, so the solar insulation is changing very rapidly during this phase of its orbit. And there's a standing question as to whether or not at its apocenter, its furthest distance from the sun, if the entire atmosphere collapses out as a frost on the surface or not. Does the atmosphere actually stay afloat throughout that whole, um, that whole uh, orbit? And um, Pluto is in a complex resonance with Neptune. Um, Many of you may know that it's in a three to two resonance with Neptune. So for every three orbits of Neptune around the sun, it orbits twice. But it's also locked in a high inclination COSI resonance with Neptune, which drives um, some more complex behavior of where the ascending node and the, um, the argument of periastrum lie. And so you can get um, sort of complex behaviors uh, over long periods of time that change the way it experiences impacts from the Kuiper belt, changes the shape of its orbit sufficiently to change the way seasons work, um, it's a very complex world on all sorts of time scales. Uh, so we're hoping to learn about geology on its surface, whether or not it's active, does it have geysers like Triton, or do you require the influence of something like Neptune to drive that kind of activity in a world like this? Um, craters on its surface, it may or may not experience um, active resurfacing, so we may get a very ancient surface or a very fresh one. Sharon, we expect to see a very ancient surface because it's smaller and it's likely it doesn't have an atmosphere, for example. Um, so it's less likely to have experienced resurfacing events um, and may preserve a wonderful record of the impactor uh, size distribution, um, something that we really can't observe from uh, our current facilities. Uh, we'll be exploring the compositions, globally resolved compositions of both these worlds and the small satellites. That's one of the things I'm responsible for on the team is um, understanding the compositions of the small satellites. And we'll be looking for new moons, partially for, um, largely for science and trying to understand this very complex system. And if we find more satellites packed in there, that's going to be an even greater challenge to to uh, describe, but also from a practical standpoint, these small satellites, when they were discovered post-launch, presented a, um, the perception of a uh, potential hazard. So um, it's not that we're going to hit a small moon, but these small moons have very low escape velocities. So anytime they're smacked by a small Kuiper Belt object, they release dust, and that dust has a very long um, lifetime in the system. It can persist if it's, if it's uh, released correctly and from a moon in the right location for periods long enough that um, 
If you put a moon in the right spot, you could create a dust torus. We're going 14 kilometers per second. Um, and so for a spacecraft like us, it doesn't take much more than, you know, roughly a piece of rice to uh, potentially cause a fatal hit to the spacecraft. So on approach, um, we're doing, uh, the Hazards team are doing uh, searches for small satellites in the remaining stable locations in the system to see if they can identify these before approach. And they've identified a series of maneuvers that can put the spacecraft on trajectories that would take them away from any tori that those moons are creating. We really don't expect to find anything threatening. None of our modeling has suggested that's a very likely scenario, but we're doing our due diligence because, like I said, we don't get our data back for 16 months. So if we're flying through the system, we don't see anything until that data has started to come down. So um, that's sort of my overview of, of where we're at and kind of what we're doing with, with um, New Horizons. And I wanted to start to back out a little bit and talk about the population beyond and what we could do with New Horizons in the future and what we can do with our existing and potential future uh, facilities to try to understand the Kuiper Belt and what it can tell us about the origin of our solar system. So to do that, I want to talk about what we can do um, for a newer minor planet population, the, uh, the asteroid belt. Um, this is a visualization I made using um, data from SDSS only. So these are the asteroids that were observed in a single monolithic well-characterized survey. Um, you started from the perspective of the Earth looking out away from the sun, and now we're backing out to get a more complete view. You can see structures in this, and many of those structures are real. So there's that green band in the middle. That's the Vesta family. It's constrained in inclination. Um, those are all objects that are compositionally similar and likely emerged from a giant impact on the large asteroid Vesta. Um, as you see, as you zoom out, you can start to see the compositional gradient across the belt. These colors are representative of taxonomic classes derived from the photometry of SDSS. So what you're seeing essentially are asteroids of different types being segregated across the disk. Beyond the main belt, you see these two clouds, which the Jupiter Trojan swarms. Um, Jupiter would lie on the, the side where they have a smaller gap, lies directly in the, the center of those two. These are asteroids in one to one motion resonance with Jupiter. On the far side of those here, you see those come back around. There's another swarm of similarly colored asteroids that are the Hildas. And they're asteroids that are in the three to two mean motion resonance with Jupiter, like Pluto, but on the inside as opposed to the outside. So they orbit the sun three times for every two orbits of Jupiter. Um, these are dynamically stable configurations. If you dynamically decompose this belt into um, uh, orbital elements, you can see gaps and clumps that are shaped by um, the influence of Jupiter, uh, it's like the Kirkwood gaps and other asteroid families that have formed over the age of the solar system and created these sort of compositionally similar clumps. Um, this kind of homogenous information where you've got these well-characterized large surveys, large samples that you can really um, you know, bring all sorts of analytical uh, tools to bear on mean that you can do some really powerful uh, cosmogonic studies of you know, what, these, what these populations tell you about the origin of the solar system. This is work from um, uh, DeMeo and Carey where they attempted to sort of reconstruct the compositional distribution of the, the asteroid belt. Um, this is showing different, um, this is sort of the average distance from the sun versus the mass in uh, different compositional classes uh, across that region. And this is really complicated plot. And I'm not gonna attempt to decompose it for you guys, but it just, there's incredible richness of information available here. And what you can do with things like this is start to assess how was material mixed across the belt primordially? What mixing occurred after the bodies formed? Um, one of the scenarios that gets that compositional gradient in place um, is something called the Grand Tack, which is this idea that, uh, that the, the red asteroids that you'd seen in the previous animation and the blue asteroids that you saw in the previous animation formed as two groups inside and outside of the primordial Jupiter. And Jupiter's uh, migration, primordial migration, wasn't simple. It actually changed direction. And so this is the Grand Tack. And that process sculpts the shape of the asteroid belt, and it also introduces material from outside Jupiter in such a way as to produce the kind of distribution that we see. So you can kind of untangle these, these large scale um, variations in what happened very early on in our solar system um, when you have this kind of a data set. The Kuiper belt isn't there yet. We've known about it for about 20 years, but to date we know of about 1,600 objects. That animation from a single survey had over 100,000 asteroids in it. So this sort of statistical, um, power in the Kuiper belt is just not as strong yet. And so one of the things that we would like to do is, is you know, move to larger surveys. We have larger samples that are better characterizable. This is the history of discoveries in the Kuiper belt. Um, down here I have the year of discovery showing and I'm revealing these as we turn them up in surveys. 
the size is represented with their absolute magnitude, so the large objects are brighter. We know Pluto since the 1930s, but it's only been in the last couple decades that the, you know, we've recognized this um, population that it exists within. And you can see all sorts of structures in here, very few of which are real. So that gap around Pluto, um, I'll talk about later, that's because of the galactic plane. Um, it's very hard to find these faint objects as they cross the galactic plane, and they move so slowly, that they take decades. So if you're cutting off that swath of the sky, you're losing that population for decades until they propagate around, whereas the asteroid belt propagates so quickly that basically if you miss the galactic plane one year, two years later, it's out of the plane. So um, uh, because I'm a good astronomer, I figured I'd do a couple plots and then do um, poorly motivated power law fits to them. This is the uh, number of known trans-Neptunian objects cumulatively uh, as a function of time versus the number of exoplanets. 2014 was the first year in which uh, the number of known exoplanets exceeded the number of TNOs. So you can see that the behavior here is very different. So what this looks like to me, and these are two power law fits, I think they, uh, they fit quite wonderfully. Um, this is the same rolling power law form, function, uh, form that we use uh, to model the size distribution of TNOs. And in fact, um, the slopes are consistent with certain size regimes. So I don't know if that's a coincidence or what, but um, it looks like we gave up. Uh, in sort of the mid 2000s, um, the discovery rate sort of paused, plateaued, and we we uh, we sort of stopped increasing these. Whereas we haven't hit any kind of plateau with exoplanets yet. It's just it's just running on and on, and the rate of discovery per year is ever increasing. I'm sure we'll hit a plateau as as you know we'll see the effect of of K, of uh, the prime Kepler mission ending and K2 kicking in. But then eventually there'll be something like tests and these other missions that come in and start picking up the pace again. So what are we going to do about TNOs? Um, you know, if you follow this trend by 2022, we'll be discovering no more. No more TNOs ever, and so that's it. And it's not that the population's running out. Um, we've discovered 1,600 in size regime that we're comfortable sampling. Um, there are tens of thousands of objects in that size regime. So uh, uh, how can we do this? LSST is an obvious, obvious champion of this, this cause, but in the near term, um, we have a few things we can do. One of the other distinctions between the TNOs and the asteroids that we'd like to get around is that we don't have that wonderful compositional data set that we have from like SDSS and other large surveys like that, where we can do um, sort of photometric classification. This is a, a single frame from that animation before where I have colored the points with a fractionally representative colors of, their, of the photometry that we have for them and left them white if they don't have any. Um, we just don't have good photometry for a large sample of these yet. So we can't do those sort of sophisticated breakdowns of compositional class versus orbital class. Um, and one of the efforts that uh, we've started recently, Lynn here is involved in it. I, I think there might be a few other people in the department that are involved uh, to one degree or another. It's called OSIS. It's the Outer Solar System Origin Survey. And this is a CFHT large program uh, that began a couple of years ago um, to try to uh, ameliorate this issue to a degree. So it's the highest priority uh, long program on CFHT. It means it executes first. CFHT is a queue executed system. So when we get the conditions that we want, it's our data that's being collected. Um, it's 560 hours divided over eight semesters. Um, shortly thereafter, uh, a group led by Wes Frazier uh, proposed to Gemini for a large and long program to follow up a flux limited sample of the OSIS discoveries with very high signal to noise uh, multiband photometry so that we can start to do a well-characterized study of the broad spectral uh, uh, spectrophotometric properties of the, the Kuiper belt. Um, it ended up becoming the highest ranked large program on Gemini North, so we get the same kind of treatment. And the data that we've been getting has been absolutely spectacular. The overall goals of the survey um, when we proposed it is roughly to discover about 1,000 new TNOs, so not quite doubling the known sample, but from a single well-calibrated survey. A lot of those um, TNOs were discovered by programs that weren't incredibly well um, uh, designed to be calibratable. Some like CFEPS um, discovered you know, several hundred um, and are very well calibrated surveys, but you know, a lot were numbers were discovered in things that where it was very difficult to constrain um, the sensitivity of the survey, the bands that they operated in, the conditions they operated under. So here we're going to have this sort of same sort of monolithic capability to go back and look at the sample and treat the sample. Um, uh, with the care that it deserves. Colossus will give us um, a sample of, you know, about 140 uh, very high signal noise colors drawn from this very well characterized sample. So, you know, we, more, we know of more TNOs with colors than this, but they're not drawn from such a well characterized sample. So the, 
the statistical inference that we can draw from that is stronger than any than anything we've been able to do before. Um, on OSIS, I lead the binaries team. Um, one of the unique properties of the Kuiper belt uh, is that it has a very high rate of binary systems. And the binaries in the Kuiper belt are unique in the solar system. They're very widely separated. Um, their angular momentum, specific angular momentum, is far too high to be generated through things like collisions or fission of two bodies. They have to be formed either through a primordial process or dynamical capture. Um, some of the ones that we found occupy up to 20% of their hill radius. They are incredibly widely separated, uh, very, very tenuously linked, um, but stable, uh, except in the presence of, say, collisions. Yep? H so HST, um, there have been a number of a number of um, very successful snapshot programs to just target hundreds of chinos, um, and it doesn't take much to find them because they're equal mass. So these systems are almost always very close to equal mass. That's the other thing that makes them unique. So you don't actually have to observe very long to find the secondary. Um, so a quick snapshot with HST on one of these, and you. Okay, so they just snapshot one they know about, and then they see. If it's minor. Yeah, exactly. So it's a it's a very straightforward observational problem, um, and because they tend to be so widely separated, they're very easy to see in HST. There's a sample of these that have been discovered from the ground because they're so widely separated. 2001 QW322 was discovered in 2001. Um, at the time, it was separated by four arc seconds. The uh, objects are less than 100 kilometers across each, and they're separated by over 100,000 kilometers. They are incredibly tenuously linked. Um, binaries, all told, uh, it's somewhere around 80 right now. Um, the rate of binary occurrence depends on the subpopulation in the Kuiper belt. So um, there's the Kuiper belt is very dynamically diverse. There are um, there's there are resonant populations like Pluto that are linked to Neptune's orbit one way or another. There are the classical Kuiper belts um, that have two components. So there's the cold classical Kuiper belt and the hot classical Kuiper belt. These are non-resonant objects that um, sort of sit in the, what, you know, what Kuiper and, and Edgeworth and others were thinking of as this disk beyond Neptune. Um, the cold classicals in particular, they're in these very low excitation orbits in a very thin disk uh, between about 42 and 47 AU. They are loaded with binaries. If you go over the entire population of the, of the trans-Neptunian populations, the rate is about 5%. If you look at the cold classicals, the average rate that we've surveyed is about 30%. If you look only at those cold classicals that are brighter than about um, an absolute magnitude of six, which translates to a diameter of sort of 150 kilometers or so, uh, they could all be binaries. So our current measurement is 75% plus or minus 25% on those, uh, but there's a fraction of those that when you observe in a single snapshot where the secondary will be aligned with the primary. And given that sampling effect, we actually can't rule out that every single cold classical Kuiper belt object larger than that size is a binary system. So uh, coming up with a formation mechanism that can produce binaries that efficiently is a bit of a challenge. These are a couple of the ones that I studied in my PhD. Um, these are very widely separated, you know, uh, roughly an arctic on the sky. So these we were able to do from the ground using um, uh, an observing technique at Gemini we called pot shot observing, where essentially we request very short duration visits and utilize that, that Q mode where basically we get ourselves ranked very highly in the queue, and the second that the observing conditions get absurdly good, they stop doing whatever they were doing, they go take our short observations, and then they go back and do whatever they needed. So we could get um, 0.3 arc seconds seeing reasonably reliably um, doing this. We can't do it for long periods of time, but these are relatively bright targets, so it's relatively easy to do. Um, so with that, we are able to characterize the orbits of these systems, um, seven of them, uh, which were the most widely separated ones known, it takes a long time. That system 2001 Q322 has a mutual orbital period, so the period of rotation about each other, of 16 years. Um, these two are more like uh, five to six years apiece. So to see a complete orbital period, it's typically longer than a PhD. I've known, I know of one PhD that was 17 years long, so technically he could have done it in, in that duration, <laughs> but, um, but not mine. So, um, one of the things that you can do with these, because they're so tenuously linked, you can look at the violence that could have been done to them in the past. Basically, if they were ever subjected to impacts or perturbations from close tidal flybys or whatever, they would have been stripped. And you can do this fully self-consistently, where you look at the whole population, even including the tighter ones, and saying, you know, okay, maybe the maybe the broadly separated ones that we're seeing were primordially tight ones that were widened. Um, and so we did that in 2010, and the hypothesis we were testing 
was this idea that this bizarre structure of the cold classical Kuiper belt, which at the distances it is from the sun, um, is very difficult to form in situ given classical accretion models. So one of the solutions was just form those bodies closer to the sun where there was more material and then push them out somehow. And there was a mechanism that was posited in 2008 that could maybe do this. And this mechanism was that you started with this disk that was closer to the sun. Uranus and Neptune were in a much tighter configuration in the past. They experienced planet planet scattering, moved outward, landed in this disk of material, threw the material out. Neptune circularizes and locks some of these things in this low inclination configuration. Um, there's a number of simulations that show you can do a reasonably okay job of reproducing some of the broad properties of the Kuiper belt doing this. But every one of those objects that gets punted out there has to have a number of close interactions with Neptune. And if you actually run the binary systems that we see by Neptune, they are stripped very efficiently. So we can't subject them to this sort of a violent injection process. And really the only thing we can see is either uh, they formed in situ or very nearly in situ. They might have been shuffled by like resonance sweeping but they can't have had this sort of a violent interaction with Neptune. These are six of the seven systems just showing what these orbits look like. This is simulated in 0.35 arc second seeing, which was sort of some of the better stuff that we got from Gemini. Um, this is in the Earth observer's frame. So these wiggles that you're seeing are parallax. Um, so the parallax period is in Earth here, and that gives you an idea sort of for the duration that we had to monitor these things. Circles are drawn where we got data. Um, you might notice that a few of these look kind of odd and they are, so um, the one in the top right there is the most widely separated binary minor planet known. It occupies over 20% of its hill-sphere separation, has this incredibly long mutual orbital period. Below that one, um, I have our internal catalog names, unfortunately, I should update those with the MPC catalog names, but it's the most eccentric binary minor planet known. Uh, it has an eccentricity of 0.9. So if you were to stand on the surface of the primary and look up at the secondary over the course of a mutual orbital period, you'd see the secondary start off about a fifth the size of the full moon, and then two years later, it would appear five times the size of the full moon on the sky, and then it would shrink back down because of the degree of the eccentricity of the orbit. And then up here in the left is, I think, a very interesting system, 2000 CF105. It is the lowest mass TNO with a measured mass. Um, it's very small, and if you assume a density typical for comets, um, the components are about 20 kilometers across. So if you want to posit a primordial mechanism for forming these systems, something that doesn't rely upon the presence of other bodies, but is in fact intrinsic to the process that formed these unique systems, you have to be able to form systems as small as that. And that's important. A lot of the mechanisms that have been posited to form TNOs rapidly and in situ are these turbulent um, concentration mechanisms where you start with a disk full of small aerodynamically active particles, sort of centimeter scale particles. The particles feel the headwind of the gas disk. The gas disk feels those particles. That induces an instability that can cause transient overdensities to form. Um, when those transient overdensities reach critical levels, they basically become genes unstable and they form like stars. These solid particles rain out and collapse. But because they're in a shearing disk, they have a lot of excess angular momentum, so they actually can't collapse to a point. They collapse to binaries. They fragment just like, um, just like stars do. That's why we see such a high binary fraction among certain populations of stars. It's a similar mechanism here. So if you do that, the current models suggest that instead of forming a nice distribution of sizes, you form a modal size. You get this peaky size distribution. And the systems or the models that can produce these binaries prefer sizes with that peak around 100 kilometers. But now we see these systems like 2000 CF105, they're sort of fractions of that size. We know that that peak must have some kind of a characteristic width that encompasses those because we don't know of any dynamical capture scenarios that can reproduce the orbital properties of these systems. This is um, a chart of these systems. So I've got in here some literature binaries. The pluses are um, from a model, but then all the triangles and squares are real data of tighter systems. And then the uh, ellipses or the regions are the uh, orbits I measured. So um, there's some really interesting stuff going on in this figure. And uh, one of the things to note is that there's a gap. And it doesn't look too significant here, but it is actually very statistically significant. Um, at inclinations around 90 degrees. So these systems, there is no preference for prograde or retrograde orientations. They orbit prograde and retrograde equally likely, but they prefer to have the poles aligned either close to up or close to down and never around 90 degrees, even though that's the largest stable phase volume. So um, if you want to form these through a capture process, which is what um, people had initially thought, you start with a sea of objects and then you're capturing binaries out of the disk, you have to do that uh, through one of two mechanisms. One is a smooth mechanism in which you have many small bodies and a few large bodies embedded in it. It's called the L2S mechanism. These two bodies fly by each other, angular momentum bleeds away into this disk, and they're captured smoothly. The other option is uh, three-body interactions where you have three large bodies encountering each other 
and one of them gets ejected, carries away some excess angular momentum, and you capture the system. If you go with the smooth capture scenario, every system you form will be retrograde. Like 98% of them will end up being in retrograde orientations. We don't see that. So you either have to come up with a way to reorient the systems and not destroy them, or you need to appeal to the L3 mechanism. The problem with the L3 mechanism, this three-body interaction mechanism, it likes making both purgate and retrograde systems, but it will occupy all possible poles. It will fill them uniformly. And we see this big gap. So if you want to appeal to that, you have to come up with a way to open this gap. There are cosine mechanisms and tidal friction that can do it, but the gap is wider than that, substantially wider. You would have to appeal to unbelievably crazy tides to get a gap that wide. So um, one of the few mechanisms that still stands that doesn't have some kind of a challenge in front of it is this collapse process. And one of the reasons it still stands is that they don't track the angular momentum spectra of the swarms that they make in these hydro simulations. So they actually just haven't made a prediction for us to test yet. Um, so there's a, a tip for you theorists out there. Don't make predictions and people can't test them. Um, so if we want to go even further and understand, right now we're using HST as a prime discovery tool. If we want to go closer than HST can, one of the few tools that we have is New Horizons. So post Pluto, we're going to be cruising out to the Kuiper Belt. And while we'll have one that we can fly by at close range, there will be dozens at long range that we can do with the lower imager. Now, we won't get the same kind of resolution. We can't resolve the bodies. But we can look for binary companions far, far closer, between 5 and 10 times closer than HST can. So this is a simulation of a Patroclus-like binary. This is the largest um, uh, L5 uh, Jupiter Trojan, uh, which is an equal mass binary system. This is what we would see at a Kuiper Belt distance from HST. The separation is like vastly subpixel. It would be very difficult to discern that this is a binary system. This is a typical flyby of one of our uh, moderate range flyby candidates, about 0.1 AU. And the system easily splits the LoRa camera. And we even get, because of our rapidly changing uh, <laughs> orientation, we can measure the pole of the system very accurately. So we can actually assess whether or not these are tidal end states of some kind of a cosi tidal friction scenario that might have been emptying this, um, this gap in the inclination space. Um, I'm running a little bit out of time, so I'll skip right through the, uh, the Neptune Trojans. This is just an example of what you can do with a calibrated population, and it's a small example. Um, the Neptune Trojans are like the Jupiter Trojans. They're objects that are in one-to-one -one mean motion resonance with Neptune. They exist in two swarms, um, leading and trailing Neptune in their orbits. Um, I got interested in these guys as part of this search that we were doing for the last four years to try to find a Kuiper Belt target to send New Horizons to. We turned up a Neptune Trojan, uh, which you see here. You can start to see the problem that I, I haven't quite alluded to yet with this survey, and that is that the direction that New Horizons is traveling is basically toward the galactic core. So if you want to find a Kuiper Belt object in that direction, it's in the worst possible place in the sky to go looking for Kuiper Belt objects. So I got brought in because of some tools I had developed for doing um, star subtraction and optimizing searches for faint TNOs in the presence of crowded fields. Um, but we turned up the cell 5 Neptune Trojan, and at the time there were seven others known, seven other Neptune Trojans known total, compared to the thousands known for Jupiter. Um, they have some really bizarre properties. They, the ones that we know of, most of them have very high inclinations, so like 30 degrees or so. This is the highest inclination Neptune Trojan known, the one we found. It's also the largest L5 Trojan in the entire solar system that we're aware of. That or it has a very high albedo. Um, this is what Neptune Trojans look like in a dynamical uh, sense. On the right here, you're looking at an inertial frame with the planets all going around. On the left here, we're, we've rotated that frame into the frame where Neptune is essentially static. And so you're seeing the motion in a co-rotating Neptune frame. And you can see these two swarms of known Trojans orbiting around the centers of libration. Um, and what you'll see here in a second, um, so the occupation, actually, an important thing to point out is that the occupation rates between these two are largely driven by the fact that the L5 swarm is in front of the galactic plane. So we have no idea if there's actually an asymmetry there, but we couldn't anticipate one from this data. But as I rotate this around here, you'll see that these are in incredibly inclined orbits. Um, they go way in and out of the plane. And so this is a really, really dynamically hot population, but a standing question had been for a long time, because these kept getting discovered in surveys that weren't looking for them, like the one we found. We weren't, we weren't designing a survey for this, but we turned one up. So we, um, the challenge is, is the fact that we're seeing these high inclination things a fluke? Is it some selection effect that we're inducing? No one had a well calibrated survey. So um, I got kind of tired of this. So we, I, we generated a method of what we call survey agnostic um, characterization, in which I'm saying, I don't know who took this data or what the conditions were, but we can use other populations that are in that data that we do know about to calibrate it. 
So I use the Plutinos, the objects like Pluto, which occupy similar orbital space, have similar selection functions on them, and use the same catalogs to basically create a model of the hypersurvey that these other surveys existed within. And you can do that in a, um, in a I, I was largely doing this so that I could learn uh, how to apply approximate Bayesian computation. Um, so doing this, I was able to extract for the first time a um, quantitative measure of the orbit distribution of the Neptune Trojans. And what that allowed me to do, this is the inclination distribution. I could demonstrate that the widths of the population, it's a, the characteristic form for inclination distributions for minor planets is a Gaussian times the sign of the inclination. So you get this bump. It kind of looks like a Rayleigh distribution. But the width, the characteristic width, had to be relatively large, at least 12 or 13 degrees, depending on whether or not there's an additional bias in there that we couldn't identify. Um, that's quite hot compared to other populations. It's quite highly inclined. So uh, how do you capture objects into this narrow resonance if they were coming from a very broad disk? Um, so I ran a series of n-body simulations front to back from uh, showing the migrating Neptune in, under some of these sort of cosmogonic scenarios of how Neptune's migra uh, migration would have progressed and embedded it in different disks and said, what can we learn about the primordial disk given even this crude measurement of the inclination distribution from these eight objects that we had where we didn't have calibrated surveys for them? And I was able to show that given what we think we understand about the migration of Neptune, the disk it migrated into had to be hot before Neptune arrived. Something had to have excited it. We don't think we can grow these objects in a hot disk. So somehow they had to grow in a cold disk, heat the disk, and then propagate Neptune through it. So one of the ways you could do this is by having a fifth giant planet that was lost early on. It, it shot out to the disk and was um, lost. or still embedded further out. We just haven't detected it yet. Um, there are other reasons why having a fifth giant makes some things easier in the solar system. So this could be evidence for that. Alternatively, and this is what I actually favor, this idea that Neptune migrated quickly um, is just incorrect. So some newer work has been looking at this, and the other way to fix this is that Neptune migrates very slowly. So it spends a lot of time stirring the disk around it before things get caught in its resonance. So just using this information that we have from these eight, eight objects and characterizing them carefully, we can say something about the history of Neptune's migration that is useful in a cosmogonic sense. So I'm going to wrap up here in the last few minutes and talk about what we can do moving outward into the Kuiper belt. Um, I told you a bit about our survey. This is our actual search field. Um, it's awful. Uh, we were using some of the largest telescopes in the world, some of the best sites in the world. We were using Subaru and Magellan. We searched for four years. We turned up about 50 new TNOs in these fields that were as faint as anyone's ever found them from the ground. And yet, we didn't have any that we could send new horizons to. We were getting tantalizingly close to that fuel margin, but we didn't get there. This is what our data actually looks like. This is an image from the Megachem imager on Magellan. Um, there basically isn't a dark pixel in this. Um, so not only this, but the objects that we're looking for, we have to get down to at least 26 magnitude to have a good chance of discovering something uh, that we can target. So this was uh, a real data reduction nightmare, and we had to use some uh, very careful and clever reduction techniques to get past all these stars and get our objects. And we did. We, ex we found them roughly the rate we expected. And essentially, we just got unlucky. If you look at the expectation rate from what we actually found, we should have found things that were within our budget, but we're just looking at a hole that's there because of you know, Poissonian fluctuations. So um, this is what, uh, given those objects that we discovered from the ground, this is what the flight to the Kuiper Belt will look like from New Horizons perspective. Um, so here we're just about to pass Pluto. That's our Neptune Trojan. Um, and now we're entering the classical Kuiper Belt. And there's all these long-range flybys. And these are all the candidates that we can use for this binary search that I was talking about. We can target with long range and use to assess whether or not they have companions much, much closer, even down to the regime of contact binaries. But what we really wanted, something that we could fly by at, of order 10,000 kilometers and actually map, resolve, and try to understand um, what do these cold classical objects look like, these weird things that have the super high binary rate. These are basically, as best we can tell, they didn't come from somewhere else in the solar system. They're in situ. They're the only population that we can point to and suggest they're an in situ population from the primordial uh, era of the solar system. These objects are about as pristine as you can get. And um, not only that, because they're so cold, they don't get injected into the inner solar system like other populations. We can go to a comet that came from the Kuiper belt, but it came from the hot population, which probably cl formed closer to the sun, or from the scattered disk, or from the resonant populations. The cold classicals are unique in many features, but we'll never get to see them through handy, you know, um, the giant planets handing us one on a silver platter, throwing one in. So we got to go there. Um, so we really wanted to do this. 
we, you know, we swung and we missed from the ground. We tried our best and we didn't find any. Um, but we still didn't think there was any reason why we shouldn't have. So 2014 was the year to go to HSD. This is an expensive survey to do with HSD because of its small imaging area, but it's the one that's most likely to succeed because we're not facing variable seeing in this incredibly crowded field. We have this incredible sensitivity from this, this facility. Um, we waited as long as we could because as you wait, the cloud that you have to search shrinks. But then if you wait too long, you don't have enough time to measure the orbit of the object and target it for this sort of close flyby. So there's a really narrow window in which you've got to go in and do this quick where it's possible to do it. You don't have to search for ages and ages and ages but you still have enough time to measure the orbit sufficiently well that you can fly arbitrarily close to one of these things. So um, <laughs> we applied for geo time to do this, um, but they tacked on some director's discretionary time at the start at 40 orbits to prove that we could do this. So they gave us this 40 orbits to say, you've asked for something like 190 orbits of time to do this search. You'd better know that you can reduce this data and find these things in it. So they gave us this 40 orbits and they gave us um, a matter of weeks to reduce it, find the TNOs, and tell them that we found um, them at the rate that we expected in these 40 orbits. No one has ever conducted a search for these things that quickly. So there were a number of things about the survey that were done weird, but one of them was that uh, this was awarded on a Friday. The first data for it hit ground that Sunday. So I was in Berkeley, I got the notification that we got the data, and I had to buy a plane ticket and fly to Boulder so that I could join the team so that we could hit this data with everything we had and search it and demonstrate that we could find them at the rate we anticipated, and we did. We got exactly the number that we anticipated, no more, no less, <laughs> and told NASA, yes, we can do this. They gave us the remainder of the orbits. We completed our survey. We found, all told, five new TNOs in the survey. We were only searching orbits because we had to uh, restrict the phase space that we were searching um, to speed the survey. Um, so we were only searching for targetable orbits. Two of those have panned out and proven to be targetable from the spacecraft. Um, the one that I think is most likely for us to target, this is one we were calling PT-1, potential target one, was actually the first object we found in the survey. Um, it's now, uh, it has a designation 2014, or yeah, uh, 2014 MU-69. Um, this one requires very little fuel for us to reach. Our early solutions indicated that there was a non-zero chance that we would just hit it if we did nothing. Um, so the, uh, the other one requires substantially more fuel, it's closer to our margins, it makes us a little more uncomfortable, but it's a larger object. And that's both, in, from an engineering perspective, we can acquire it earlier from the spacecraft and do final corrections more easily, but also, if there's this fundamental size, that's closer to the peak. And so maybe that's the one we want to go to. But both are very clearly called classical objects. So these are these unique objects that we can't see any other way. Um, if we do fly to them, and we will ignite the end of the New Horizons um, in October of this year to target one of the two, but the question right now is there is no actual extended mission approved for New Horizons yet. So we're going to light up the engines, target this thing, and then we have to go to NASA and say, so uh, <laughs> we're in a few years, we're going to fly by this thing that we'll never get another chance to do. Um, can we turn on the cameras? Uh, so when that's approved, um, the flyby will occur in early 2019. Um, this is what the configuration looks like that we're flying into. So like I said, we're bulleting past Pluto there. This orange object or this orange orbit is PT-1. The orange swarm are the cold classicals. You can see it's neatly embedded within them. Um, this is my artist interpretation of the kind of flyby that we might do. These are very, um, very red objects. They're redder than Mars. Um, and this is a simulation that John Spencer did using one of the Saturnian satellites of an equivalent size, sampled at the resolution of our imager at our expected close approach. So this is the kind of imagery that we might <laughs> anticipate from our LoRa camera during flyby, but we'll also have our hyperspectral maps. Um, to look at sort of distribution of volatiles on the surface and anything else that you could want. Um, and I'm going to wrap up before the top of the hour here just by talking about what we might be able to do in the future very briefly. This is a mission I just proposed to Simplex. It's a CubeSat. Um, right now, we can pro uh, probe with HST down to diameters of several tens of kilometers in the Kuiper Belt. If you want to go much smaller than that, you have to use indirect methods, much like transiting exoplanets. There's a method called serendipitous stellar occultations in which you wait for small Kuiper belt objects to pass in front of stars, but the geometry is very different from an exoplanet transit. You're in the Fresnel regime, so you get very complex diffraction-dominated shadows. So instead of seeing a dip, you see a ringing. The other reason, or the other way the geometry is different is that the time scales are much different. The Fresnel scale at Kuiper belt distances is about 1.6 kilometers. At the relative rates of motion of the Earth in the Kuiper belt, that sweeps across an observer in 0.2 seconds. So if you want to resolve that ringing, you have to observe incredibly quickly. Um, the Nyquist rate for sampling this is 40 hertz. So you have to be imaging background stars 40 times a second in order to have a chance to detect these occultation events. 
So um, we designed a CubeSat at Swery that would uh, target open star clusters um, where we'd have a large high density of background stars. And we're using a new, um, new type of CMOS imager that you can actually just get off the shelf that can run at these high frame rates and produce uh, less than one electron of noise per read. These are ridiculous um, low noise imagers. Uh, we can package these three 90 millimeter telescopes in this uh, platform and three of these fast imagers um, and perform a survey that would allow us to distinguish between formation mechanisms that have been propo uh, proposed for uh, Kuiper Belt objects, either uh, this sort of monolithic collapse illustrated here um, as model two, where you start with things that are like 100 kilometers across, or another proposed model that produces objects or starts from objects that are about a kilometer across and then experiences runaway accretion. These predict very different populations of one kilometer objects, and so targeting this population and assessing how many there are um, is a really powerful discriminant for this population. And if the top model is correct, we expect about 70 detections. If the lower one is, is uh, correct, we expect about five. So we can actually measure both of these populations if they exist. This is a quick illustration of just the geometry here, um, but I'm going to skip on just to show you guys a little bit of, I'm very proud of this. We just finished this little spacecraft, and I think it's quite cute. The enabling technologies are these very small, compact, a-thermal telescopes um, that we're having designed for seasonal dynamics, and then these very low noise, off-the-shelf CMOS imagers that allow us to image at incredibly high frame rates without adding any extra noise. And overall, the spacecraft is about the size of a shoebox, and yet we can probe the origin of worlds in the outer solar system in um, a very short time. If, if funded, um, start to finish, this mission takes less than four years from the day we get the go-ahead uh, to mission closeout. It's a very rapid development project, and um, it's a very nice time scale for uh, students, grad students, because you can bring them in at the start, and they can go all the way through and finish it and see it out. So that's something that we've been really excited to try to do. Um, we've got a website for it, Flickr.space, so if you want to follow along um, with the proposal and our other approaches to get it flown, um, you can do so there. I've uh, run a little over time, so I'm sorry for that, but uh, thanks for listening. I know people probably have to get going, but let's take a couple of questions, and then Alex is available afterwards for a few minutes. So does anyone have a question? Yeah. When you fly by Pluto or any other targets, do you hit it while you fly by? Yeah, so that's one of the limiting factors for how close we can go, because we don't have a, um, a camera platform a scanning platform like you had for the Voyagers and more complex missions. Or in the case of Stardust, they had a, a mirror that could um, guide, the, guide the image. We have to turn the entire spacecraft. And in order to do that, like I said, we don't have gyros. We have to light our engines. And so it's consumable. It's also not very stable, right? You're, you're basically doing these impulsive turns. Um, so uh, that limits basically the maximum rate at which we could approach. We could, in principle, skim right over the surface with no ill effect. We'll punch right through Pluto's atmosphere. It wouldn't do a thing. but um, we wouldn't get any good data. Um, Alan Stern, the PI of the mission, likes to describe it as like flying a fighter jet past a barn and trying to take a picture of it. Like it's it's very difficult if you're really close. He's flown in fighter jets, so I think he might have a better idea of like how that actually would go. I, I don't think that's very intuitive for most of us. Do we have any other questions? Yeah. Um, I thought there, there was a survey at Palomar with the Chimera camera to do, um, to do the transit uh, yeah, so there, there have been a number of attempts from the ground. The challenge from the ground, there's a number of insidious noise sources. So things like bats or birds flying in front of the telescope mm -hmm. um, can produce occultation signals that mimic these. Um, additionally, uh, and the real killer for this, is um, scintillation. Scintillation can produce noise signatures that look just like this. So you have to use clever techniques like having arrays of telescopes on the ground that are targeting the same stars that are separated by enough that they're not in like the same patch of sky, so you're not looking at the same atmosphere, but they're not so separated that you're in a different part of the shadow of this object that's a couple hundred meters across. So unfortunately, those two scales make it very difficult to do this correctly from the ground. There's still attempts, and they could go after effectively from the ground more distant populations. The Fresnel scale increases with distance, and the rate at which you have to sample goes down because the rate that you're moving underneath the shadow, um, well, you can you can go off opposition to get different projected rates, but the um, so they can go after like Oort cloud objects without too much ill effect, but from the ground, no one's ever done a convincing. We have five million star hours collected on the ground of astronomy or of photometry looking for these, and we have about thirty thousand star hours. Excuse me, from space, space looking for them. We've seen two potential occultations from space. They're low signal to noise, and people can test whether or not they're real. But no one's ever seen one from the ground that's convincing, despite that huge asymmetry and the, the amount of time that's been spent on it. So space is really the ideal platform.
that or a high altitude balloon, and we consider that as well. Yeah. Do, do your searches uh, put any interesting limits on the size distribution uh, that far in the capital? Yes, they do. Um, so our um, our HST survey is now the largest survey that's ever been conducted for small TNOs. Um, we had a purpose for doing it, and it was supported by mission funds. So when we went to HST and asked for this, we said we're getting a large program, but we're not going to ask any money to do this thing because we're we're using mission funds to support the scientists to do this. Now we're looking at the data set and going, can we finish that? Um, we have a really interesting measurement of the science distribution and we need to do this carefully. And it's gonna take some time to go back and calibrate the data that we've collected in such a way to be able to pull that measurement out accurately. I've done a preliminary pass. And if the preliminary characterization is at all representative of what we end up getting carefully in the end, we can for the first time rule out that the small objects in the Kuiper belt are in collisional equilibrium. The, um, the limits on the size distribution slope at small sizes have been fuzzy for a long time, and they've admitted solutions where the small objects are in a collisional cascade. They're, the number of small objects is balanced by the number of, of larger objects, and they're basically repopulating each other. There's a characteristic slope for an object of given strength that will be produced by that. The slope we measure um, rules out at something like 99.8% that slope. It's below it. So either um, either the characterization isn't right, and we have to do this more carefully. But if it's right, um, we might be looking at a transient, uh, uh, transient feature in the size distribution. When you start with something that is not in collisional equilibrium, particularly if it's steeper, you get these uh, propagating waves, where basically equilibrium propagates throughout the thing, and you get these local wiggles, where you drop below, and then above, and then back to collisional equilibrium. And that propagates down to large size as time progresses. So we could be looking at that. We could also be looking at um, a signature of this growth process where we started with a single size and then through collisions we're, we're populating the smaller sizes, but we're coming from below, whereas traditionally think about filling up that or reaching that size distribution from above and grinding it down. But since we see it below it, perhaps what we're seeing is that we haven't reached collisional equilibrium yet because we didn't have any small objects to start and we're filling it up with fragments from larger objects. So that's that's really tantalizing, and I think it's going to be a really killer data set for this. We uh, almost tripled the number of objects in the size regime that we know about with this survey. Um, so it's really, you know, regardless, it's statistically powerful whether or not the current uh, characterizations are correct. Um, and I hope to finish that in the next couple months. So we'll take one more question if we have one. And um, we're going to go to lunch. So if anyone wants to walk with us and go get a sandwich, um, you can do so. Does that, do we have one more question? All right. Well, thanks. Uh,